Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we are getting started for this week's uh, GES seminar. I'm Andy Miller. I coordinate the seminar for the department. Um, before we get started, I just want to point out we have another seminar coming up next week. So I'm just going to put that on the screen for a moment. Um, next week's seminar is with Dr. Susan Sterrett in the School of Public Policy here at UMBC. And her topic is warning of displacement in a changing climate, loss, choice, and uncertainty. So look forward to that. I'll be sending out a flyer about that later today. I'm gonna to go ahead now and um, ask uh, Catherine Barnhart, one of our graduate students to introduce our speaker. So um, Catherine, would you go ahead please and read the introduction? Um, Sean Kennard is a PhD candidate in the Biological Sciences Department at Virginia Institute of Marine Science. He completed his BS degree in Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences at the University of Washington and has worked as a field ecologist monitoring juvenile salmon in Alaska and as hatchery specialist in Washington. He has carried out research in coastal stream ecology at Texas A&M and has published a recent paper on fish and macroinvertebrate assemblages in coastal streams, as well as serving as co-author of a paper on coastal ecosystem responses to hurricane impacts. Okay, Sean, I just managed to make you the presenter, so you can go ahead and share a screen. Yeah, let me do that, here we go. All right, is it coming in clear? Looks great. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. I will be talking about the effects of rainfall on stream communities. This is uh, in the background, one of the streams. So to get you kind of oriented to the systems that we're going to be talking about today. And there's also this conceptual diagram where uh, that is kind of a visual depiction of what my dissertation deals with, which is finding ways in which precipitation connects with some intermediate drivers and also bypassing those intermediate drivers and just trying to understand just the direct relationships between precipitation and stream communities. Uh, these are my collaborators. I work with Dr. Patrick um, Hogan, Reese, uh, Brander Zandon, and some of my uh, graduate colleagues are Fernando Carvalho, Bradley Strickland, and Alex Solis. Without further ado, Global warming is changing ecosystems. Um, this is a picture of wildfires in Australia that was taken from outer space. And we noticed the fire regimes around in a lot of ecosystems are changing and that's both a result of climate change and also um, management practices that's re resulting in this perfect storm that is altering these ecosystems. Similarly, we see things like sea level rise from the melting of polar ice caps and increasing intensity and frequency of hurricanes and tropical storms around the globe. Lastly, I'd like to bring your attention to something that's occurring uh, more often during the summers in the Pacific Northwest, which is the fact that summers are characterized more by long uh, droughts and things like that. And so the climate is changing the way that these ecosystems operate and whether or not that is to our benefit is, is not clear. While a lot of the debate and conversation about climate change revolves around temperature, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on the effects of global warming on the hydrologic cycle. Namely, uh, as the atmosphere becomes warmer, it, uh, the troposphere becomes more energetic. And so we see the intensification of precipitation profiles on a regional basis. This is a, a, a figure that depicts the expected changes in precipitation in the United States over the next 100 years. And you can see that some areas are expected to change very little, whereas areas like the Eastern Seaboard and the Pacific Northwest are expected to experience big changes in precipitation. Getting a little bit more specific, I pulled up a couple of cities and, and looked at the low emissions projections from NOAA. The blue line here uh, shows the expected changes in precipitation in Richmond, Virginia, and you can see that it rises uh, by about two centimeters uh, per year, and then it comes back down to being about one centimeter greater than it is currently. Con contrast that with Claybird, Texas, which is where I was working, and you see that the precipitation regime becomes drier there for a while before maybe returning back to normal. 
So these are just a couple of examples of the fact that we expect places to change a little bit. Another change uh, in the hydrologic cycle revolves around cyclonic energy in around the, the equator in the Atlantic. This is the accumulated cyclone energy index from NOAA, and it shows it, it takes into account the frequency of tropical storm events and their intensity. And you can see that from 1950 to about 1970, there was a fair number of years that were above normal cyclonic energy. Then we entered a 40 year period where there was normal or below normal cyclonic energy. And since 2010, we've entered another period of high above normal cyclonic energy. And so cyclone energy is, is in a period of hyper uh, frequency and intensity. So how will streams respond to these changes in rainfall? We know that um, streams, that rainfall uh, directly controls how much water there are in streams and the flow regime in those streams. This represents the availability of water and the disturbance regime in the form of floods and droughts. We also know that uh, ample amounts of rainfall can dilute things like wastewater and pollution, and, and that decreases its impact on the local communities. Rainfall also influences stream communities indirectly by interacting with the watershed. Rainfall controls the types of uh, vegetation that we see. As specifically in the riparian zone, you can see changes that result in restriction of light, the types and quantity of debris that are entering the streams, as well as the buffering capacity of the riparian zone, which simply is its ability to absorb nutrients and things like that before they enter the streams. These are all factors that Im influence the kind of communities that we see, and that's a big concern for managers. My dissertation really asks the question, can we understand these things in turn, both, both in terms of the individual drivers, but also just in terms of what is the effect of precipitation on these communities? So, some of the specific questions that I'll be tackling is whether changes in rainfall will increase community diversity, whether it alters the community composition, whether it changes the type of food resources that are at the bottom of a food web, and whether altogether systems that exist with different rainfall, are they more apt to cope with disturbances or are they more vulnerable to disturbances? And will those systems uh, be, be changing in the future? So to, to tackle these questions, we had to find a suitable region, region to, to study existing changes uh, across the precipitation gradient. Texas is an amazing place because it has a wind-driven precipitation gradient. This is uh, a map of Texas, and you can see West Texas is very dry, and East Texas can get very wet. And we're going to be focusing in on this rate region here called the Texas Coastal Prairie. As you drive across it from the southwest to the northeast, you'll notice a change in a noticeable change in vegetation from scraggly mesquite trees here in this arid photo to li live oak, pecan, and moss uh, strewn trees in the bayou in, in the Houston area. So this place is very unique because it has these changes in precipitation without associated changes in temperature, elevation, or geology, which are typical of any rainfall gradients in, in most studies that, that try to do the same thing. So to orient you guys, here are some photos of the amazing streams that I was working in. This is a, a pretty urbanized stream uh, coming out of uh, these arid regions, and I say it's urbanized because there's these the the watersheds are huge, um, and the flow is relatively low compared um, to the other streams, and that results in the accumulation of things like wastewater. And so you can see um, they don't look too good, and then all of a sudden we we as we get um, more rainfall, we notice a change in the streamside vegetation. We see some live oak trees and some pecan trees, and eventually the trees overhanging the streams themselves. And, and so we're gonna talk a little bit more about those effects, but just think about how maybe 
a tree growing over a stream would totally change what is growing inside the stream. So we wanted to see what was going on in these systems. And so we needed to conduct some initial surveys. So here's another map that zooms in on this region of Texas. And we selected 13 sites to go look and see what fish were growing in these streams as well as macroinvertebrates. We selected a region that spanned a precipitation gradient of 66 to 125 centimeters per year of rainfall over a distance of 390 kilometers. So the rainfall doubled within a four hour drive. The elevation changes only from 18 to 50 meters throughout the region, and all of the geology is uh, pretty much the same throughout the region, with there being perhaps more loam in the areas where there's more vegetation throughout the watershed. So we selected 13 weightable streams, and they these are located right next to USGS gauges, which record the daily flow, climate data, and watershed characteristics for each of our sites. So we're able to tap into long-term existing databases. We went out in 2017 and we collected water quality, channel morphology data, sediments, and canopy coverage. We also collected the invertebrates using kicknet samples, which is here in the top panel. This is a DNet kicknet and a sieve bucket where you go around, shake things up, and see what you catch. And we, we also collected sediment cores where you take sediment, um, the top five centimeters of sediment, and then you figure out what's living inside of that in the given area. We also collected data on the fish by using an electrofishing backpack. We deployed block nets to lock off a reach, and then we conducted a three pass electrofish depletion where we estimate the entire population of the fish within that reach. So, looking at the data, we can see that fish diversity has a positive relationship with precipitation. This is Shannon entropy which takes into account the species richness, as well as the evenness of uh, the abundance distributed across those different species. And we've plotted it against annual precipitation. And you can see that as precipitation goes up, so does the, the diversity of the fish community. Looking at some of the intermediate drivers, we also found that fish diversity declined with increasing conductivity so the conductivity is a measure of how many solutes there are in the system. So it appeared that fish diversity does well in areas where solutes are dilute, and it doesn't do so well when there's high concentrations of solutes in the system. So now we're gonna look at the compositions and see how they differ across the region. This is a community ordination. Specifically, it's in a redundancy analysis. And I'm going to build it up for you in your head. These dots represent the different communities or the different streams that we looked at. And they're plotted in a multidimensional space where the more similar the communities are, the closer the dots will be to one another. And so you can see that the dots are also um, colored by the precipitation. So these darker sites are the sites that have more precipitation, and these lighter sites are the ones that receive less precipitation. And you'll notice that uh, the, there's these red dots or pluses, which represent the, the different species of fish. And so what this means is that these wetter sites are dominated by sunfish species. And these two uh, wet sites were distinguished because they had this red shiner species. Uh, we've also got some marine migrants and some catfish and things. But I also want to bring your attention to these yellow sites which are ordinated right next to this guppy species. And so what this all means, oh, and we also, to make things more complicated, we've also superimposed some vectors that represent the, the various intermediate environmental drivers that we suspect are at play here. And the red one is a significantly correlated uh, vector based off of the rotation of this. So, Basically, what it's what we see here is that there's this axis of precipitation and conductivity of, and ammonia, as well as this low flow pulse, which just we use to as a proxy for drought effects. But I really want to hone in on this precipitation, conductivity, and ammonia relationship because as precipitation increases, uh, we get 
the, these communities, and as it decreases, we get these communities. And similarly, the conductivity and ammonia are driving what we see in these communities over here. So, we see that the guppies are dominating the arid streams, and we see the introduction of sunfish, catfish, and things like and other species when when conditions become wetter. Now let's look at the invertebrate uh, communities. Uh, the relationship with diversity is a little bit unclear. We've this is the Shannon entropy across precipitation, and you might say that there's a peak in diversity in the middle of the gradient, but we're also wondering if maybe there was an outlier effect here. I could not find a way to justify removing this outlier, and so it's just there, and it, it, it causes problems for any kind of useful interpretation of this diversity data. Now, looking at some of the intermediate drivers, we identified the low flow pulse percentage as a negative predictor of Shannon diversity in our invertebrate communities. So that means that the more often that there are low flows in a stream, uh, we expect the diversity of the macroinvertebrate community to be to be less. So there, the diversity is less when there's more droughts at play, according to this figure. So looking at the community ordination of invertebrates, the similar setup, we got the sites repre represented by dots that are colored by precipitation, we have species represented by the plus signs and some pictures to, to highlight some of the ones on the outside here. And we can see here that the uh, the yellow sites are in this bottom, bottom right quadrant. And there are a lot of these snail species associated with our drier sites. And as conditions become wetter, as we get more precipitation, um, the flashiness of the, the, the flow regime increases. And we again see this conductivity precipitation axis, um, and we can see that there are mayflies, stoneflies, beetles, uh, shrimp species, decapods. We've got trichopterans, uh, which are your caddisflies. Um, just a, a, a wider variety of different functional groups of insects. Whereas here we see a proliferation of a lot of different snail taxa, which might explain why we didn't see a diversity relationship because there's a lot of diversity in snails, but they're all snails still. So uh, functional uh, trait analysis by my colleague found that there were functional trait differences and that um, is pretty interesting. So, but I, I digress. So to summarize, we have the rainfall controls composition through flow and solute effects. Specifically, the aridity constrains through physical factors. The aridity is favoring live bears and salt tolerant taxa, and it's driven by the low flow periods and subsequent water quality conditions where there's high concentrations of solutes. So this is the sailfin molly. This is the guppy that is pre predominant in some of these arid systems. It's urihaline, which means it's able to tolerate a wide range of salinities, and it can tolerate up to 87 units of salinity. The ocean is at 30. So these desert streams and things like that can get very salty, and this little guppy does well at surviving those, those conditions. It also has this upward turned mouth, which allows it to exploit the surface film of water, which is oxygen rich. So even in a puddle that is anoxic, these guppies can sip the air at the very top of the, the, the puddle, and they're able to survive because they're able to get oxygen out of that. Looking at our humid uh, streams, it appears that humidity permits sensitive specialists. We see um, some of these bigger fish, these predator taxa, these big omnivores. This is a flathead catfish, and some of these are pretty sensitive. So this is a flathead catfish, which can only tolerate up to 10 salinity, and it has specific breeding requirements. It requires submerged logs, and it prefers um, deep pools with slow flows, which those might uh, be available sometimes in an arid system, but uh, not always. And so that might be uh, excluding some of these more sensitive uh, taxa like that. So the take home from this, which was a, a publication in a Pure J article, was that the precipitation is controlling these communities by controlling the availability of water, the, the dilution effects of solutes, and uh, that is also related to the buffering capacity of the riparian zone. And so we're going to start adding more onto this by looking at food webs. So these compositional shifts that we went out and took a snapshot of are indicative of 
different food webs in these systems. And so when we look at a stream food web, there's two different sources for energy at the bottom of the food web. The first is terrestrial in the form of fallen leaves, grasses, detritus, anything that's falling into the stream from the watershed around it. And that is called alochthonus. And we also have aquatic resources, which are your, your algae, your, your aquatic macrophytes, your, your hornwort, your milfoil, all those things, things that are growing inside the water. And those are autochthonous sources. And so here we have the terrestrial sources on the left with these little leaves, and we see uh, a system, uh, the pathway of diatoms, algae, things like that, that are growing in the stream on the right. And so this is, uh, these these leaves feed a shredder community, which breaks down those leaves, which can then feed um, larger predators and things like that. On the flip side, we have diatoms, which uh, feed scrapers and grazers and things like that that uh, are looking for um, some some salad on the bottom of the stream, and then that feeds a, a variety of predators and collectors. Together, it creates a really big, robust two source system. But maybe if uh, we, we, would, we would expect one side to be favored, depending on how much precipitation is going on. So, one of the question is, do humid canopies limit algal growth, which would represent a, a bottom-up control on these systems? And so, here's a, a picture of one of the pecan trees at our stream, and you can see not much is getting through. And so, we would expect light to be cut off and there, for there not to be that other side of the food web in that system. And so that might show a big favoring towards this left side of this food web diagram. On the other side, we see uh, aridity might limit the, uh, the ability for large fish to exist in the system as we, we discover that the, the harsh water quality and things like that, and that represents a top-down control by excluding the predators. And so this is a mesquite tree and it, it's a lot more open. The leaves are much smaller and we might expect more light to be entering the system, which would feed the algae system. But we see the exclusion of these predators and the exclusion of, of course, particulate or organic matter because mesquite trees are evergreen and they do not drop their leaves into these systems. And that's because um, it's a way of conserving uh, moisture for the tree. So, how do we look and see what the effects of rainfall are on algal growth? We selected three iconic streams uh, that span the gradient, and we deployed these fish exclosures, which are basically uh, four pylons with a mesh net that keeps fish out of a given area. And then we use, we deployed some ceramic plates, which allow the algae to grow on a hard substrate that we can then gauge how much algae grows in a given amount of time. And we did play three plates uh, with four controls and 32 plates per total. And we use a bentho torch, which measures the algae in terms of the irradiance and, and the absorption and Looking at the results from this algal plate study, we can see that algal growth declines as the climate becomes wetter. So here we have the total algae and the colors represent our different treatments. But you can see that overall, there's less algae on the plates as the conditions become wetter. And you'll notice also that the algae is growing well inside of the exclosures in the arid stream. So this red represents the, the plates that were inside of those cages. And we can see that it's higher, the algal, algal growth was higher inside of the cages on the arid side, but that it changes at the wetter side. And this represents some kind of change in the trophic dynamics that are occurring. What does it all mean? In the drier climate, fish effects are reducing the algae. We expect that that is because of direct fish herbivory. These guppies are able and avid vegetarians if they need to be, and um, we've observed them munching on the algae in these systems. And so there appears to be direct herbivory on the algae. So when we excluded them from the algae plates, they weren't able to graze on those plates as much, which is why we saw more algal growth on the plates inside of the cages.
Looking at the wetter sites, the fish effects appear to promote algae. So this is a subhuman stream, and we expect that the fish predation is reducing the number of invertebrate herbivores that exist in those systems. And so this is a predator re mediated relief of herbivory on the, the humid systems. So these are some of the potential mechanisms that are, are driving uh, the, the observation that we see between these exclusion uh, experiments. So looking more deeply, we want to see what is inside of the different things that are in these food webs. We do that using stable isotopes. Stable isotopes of carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen exist in natural ratios that vary depending on where it was originally acquired and the biological processes that um, turned it into a biological molecule. So, for example, carbon is used to track sources. This is a figure where the carbon value is on the x-axis and the nitrogen is on the y-axis. And you can see that uh, these black dots were uh, representative of the terrestrial sources and the white dots are from aquatic sources. And so you can see that they have a different isotopic signature uh, depending on whether they were synthesized inside of water or outside of water. Nitrogen is more typically used to track the food chain position. As a, a protein is eaten, broken down, and reassimilated, reassimilated by uh, the next thing that eats it, Every time it's consumed and recycled and integrated, it undergoes a, a process called fractionation. And um, it's incremental. So the higher you go up the food chain, the more the nitrogen uh, value will increase. And so we see that there are these stepwise increases. And so you can track to see how high in a food chain something is based off of its nitrogen signature. Lastly, hydrogen is this new isotope that's being used. It's a little more tricky to, to get your hands on it and to analyze it, but it, it appears to track sources with a higher resolution than carbon. So, does rainfall change the base of the food web? Arid food webs, we expect, have these evergreen arid resistant shrubs with a lack of leaf inputs. So, we expect uh, the to have less leaf inputs and also less of these predators. And we expect there to be a compressed food web. You cut off the side of the food web. So let's look at food webs in ISO space. I apologize if my dog is barking, the mailman's here. All right, so we have food webs in ISO space. These are three sites that we chose. And um, we have carbon on the x-axis and hydrogen on, on the uh, y-axis. Maybe I can turn the volume down. All right. So we've colored the uh, different um, sources here. So we have blue is our terrestrial source, and, uh, and this brown shade is our aquatic sources. Now, we want them to be diff different um, ellipses, ellipses from one another because we want um, the, to gauge whether the communities are favoring, favoring one resource over the other. And so carbon and hydrogen are great for determining uh, the source of, of food. And so we are going to superimpose the communities. And so the communities should lie within the boundaries of these two circles, and we see that these communities do, in fact, um, are inside, and there's a lot going on here. This is just to give you an idea for what the data looks like, and then I'm going to show you some more informative figures right after this. We can also look at the nitrogen, which traces the trophic position, and here the size of the dots represents the, the trophic position, and we have nitrogen pollution in our, our arid sites, but our wetter site has less nitrogen pollution because of the dilution effects associated with precipitation. So we actually see the gradient uh, that you would expect to see as you go from the basal resources with small dots to some of the, the 
big fish that are in these systems, which have really big dots because they've assimilated the nitrogen so many times through the food web. So looking at a uh, little breakdown of the these these values. So this is carbon. We have the aquatic sources, terrestrial sources here, and we expect them to be different. And you'll notice here that uh, we have depleted carbon signature in the humid site and an, an enriched carbon signature in this site. And we have our uh, detritus right here and our invertebrates and our fish show these stepwise patterns of depletion in the, in the carbon. So that's pretty interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll get that, get more on that in the next slide. Looking at the nitrogen, we see that we have, um, High nitrogen in both of our arid sites, which indicates that there's wastewater entering these systems, and that uh, the fact that the the wet site had the the normal nitrogen values is evidence that the solution to pollution is in fact dilution through uh, the natural precipitation regime in these systems. And so, similarly, we see the same pattern in the the invertebrates and fish, which we kind of expect to see. And lastly, the hydrogen, we can see here that hydrogen is great at determining the difference between terrestrial and aquatic sources because these aquatic sources are very low compared to these sources, which are very high on this graph. And we see the stepwise pattern here in the invertebrate community and um, something a little different in the fish community. So this isotope appears to be a much more useful, um, less confounded variable compared to the carbon. And it's much easier to interpret. So. We, it was good that we use hydrogen to try and answer some of these questions. And there's regional source stability with hydrogen um, isotopes across this, this region. So, all right, so we put the hydrogen and the carbon data into a mixing model, which estimates the, the relative source contribution to, to the various uh, tissues of these animals. We've selected animals that exist in all three sites that span this gradient, which include a clam, uh, a couple, uh, a damselfly, and a dragonfly species, as well as the the herbivorous guppy that we talked about earlier, some sunfish, and bigger sunfish uh, that are even some, the kind of sunfish that eat other fish. So um, this is kind of a nice swath that represents the different members of the food web across this whole region. And, um, oh, I just wanted to bring your attention here. We have the three sites that are uh, colored by the, the amount of precipitation that they receive. And we've plotted the contribution of aquatic sources on the Y axis here. And so you'll see that in the drier site, there's a, there appears to be maybe more aquatic source contribution compared to the wetter sites. When I show you the rest, You'll notice that as we get um, to the fish species, we start to see significant difference. Um, and so we see that this uh, pattern in the aquatic source utilization is magnified at the higher trophic levels in these food webs. And so we're able to see that um, aquatic source assimilation is highest in the dry stream and terrestrial source assimilation is highest in the wetter sites. Looking at the range um, of, of these isotopes, um, we can see that the source variability rises with rainfall in, in fish. So we're just talking about um, the total range of values within the fish community. And so um, the highest range of values was found in the wetter site. And for hydrogen, we see a, a bit of a different pattern, which may in indicate that there's specialization occurring at the ends and the mixture uh, of the various trophic types in the middle. And in the invertebrates, we see rising source variability in, in invertebrates. Lastly, looking at the nitrogen data, we can see that there's a short arid food chain. So the range of nitrogen indicates the, the minimum. Uh, so that's like the bottom of the food web and then the maximum of trophic fractionation, that process where nitrogen gets reintegrated over and over again. And so this has the least value, which we interpret to mean that the sh it has the short uh, food chain in the arid site. And then within the invertebrate community, we kind of see a different pattern 
where there's a long food chain in the invertebrate community at the arid site. So what does it all mean? We gotta, we gotta see how big, uh, what these niche spaces for these different communities are before I tell you what it all means. And so we got, um, here's this three dimensional convex whole volume. It's three dimensional because we use carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And then we use that to estimate this three dimensional polygon for the different communities. So we have the invertebrate community here in the triangles and the fish community on the circles. And I'm going to try, uh, uh, provide some commentary on the possible reasons why we see the pattern that we do right here, where invertebrate communities at the dry side have obligate grazers, which are specialized at that low end of the food chain that has all those snails and they're grazing like crazy and all they eat is that algae. So their signature is very keyed in on the algae signature. But we also see um, the largest food chain here um, in the invertebrate community because they have these apex predators. This is a uh, Bellostomatid, and it's an avid snail eater. I had one in an aquarium, and he had a, a snail graveyard underneath where he used to live in my aquarium. And so these guys are specialized predators that eat, eat these snails in addition to other um, things. They even eat um, fish if you give them a chance. They harpoon them, and they inject them with digestive juices, and then they slurp out the fish like it's a slushy. So there's these cool predators, uh, invertebrate predators at those systems. And we see a loss of all the snail species. And so everything is kind of in the middle here. Everything's eating kind of a mixture of everything. Um, uh, and that might uh, explain the loss of whole volume space, this niche space of the entire community. And then lastly, we see the gain of specialists, obligate shredders, and maybe some migratory taxa, which would expand the, the trophic niche space of the entire uh, community here. Looking at the fish, we see uh, a, a low value here at the arid site because it's mostly herbivores, not very much uh, diversity in what's eating or what they're going to eat in that system. Then we see the introduction of omnivores, which are eating you know different insects and things like that. So we see a, a high amount of niche volume here because there's things that are eating, um, there's herbivores as well as these omnivores and things that are eating um, bugs that are also in a, a mix, mixed state. And then lastly, we see um, the loss of those herbivorous fish, which are just free dinner for largemouth bass and warmouth sunfish that we see at the wetter side of the gradient. So putting it all together, the arid food webs rely on aquatic resources. They have invertebrate trophic expansion with an invertebrate apex predator. Here's a photo of a bellostomatid eating a fish, just like I told you, it's crazy. And that the fish are specialized herbivores. These guppies are pretty much dominant in these systems. And so we see kind of a low um, trophic niche space in fish communities in these areas. Human food webs rely on terrestrial inputs. They have invertebrate specialists and fish resumed their, their role as the apex predator in these systems. So this is what the isotope data and the algal experiment kind of told us in the end. And so now we've added on to our conceptual model the effects of the debris that are entering the stream from um, the, the various deciduous trees that grow at the wetter side of the gradient, as well as the effects of light um, through sh shading effects, because we saw that algae growth decreases with precipitation. This is a little break. This is just some happy photos of me working in Texas. Um, this is my friend Fernando. We did a lot of work together. He found a chicken at one of our sites once and uh, decided um, that that was more important than doing um, fish processing with me. And uh, this is us electrofishing, a garter snake, and more electrofishing. This is us taking a fin clip of a spotted gar um, for genetic analyses. And this is a buffalo carp that I caught on my first day um, after uh, fishing uh, following Hurricane Harvey. Speaking of Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Harvey arrived on August 26, 2017 with winds in excess of 130 miles per hour. This is an excellent opportunity to study how 
these communities would respond to a massive 50 year disturbance in this area. It's the wettest tropical cyclone on record in the United States. And you can see the, how much rainfall it dropped here. Uh, some areas, I think, uh, received upwards of uh, 25 inches. So these are the sites that we monitored following Hurricane Harvey, these little circles here. And these are the hydrographs from all of those sites. The hydrographs um, indicate massive flooding at all but one site. Uh, so all but this uh, SFC, which is San Fernando Creek. And so we wanted to see how will the communities recover. So we initiated a campaign to um, sample these sites, all, all nine of them monthly for 14 months following the hurricane to, to analyze uh, the recovery patterns of the communities in these areas. And this is uh, the abundance of fish on a log scale in the months following the hurricane. And the, the responses vary. So it, it looks like a lot of spaghetti on the screen right now. So we have months after the hurricane here and with the sites are represented by the different color with the arid site being yellow and the darker sites being um, the, the, the humid sites being darker. And you can see that some sites have this hump immediately afterwards, whereas others just kind of decrease or stay stable. So I needed to figure out which sites were which because that's there might be some kind of pattern going on there. So um, in the in the one to three months, there's this period of recovery where there everything's starting out below zero. The, the storm washed all of the fish out, and then they return relatively quickly. They return within two to three months, evidently. And then there's this flood pulse response where the abundance in the stream exceeds what's ordinary for that time of year. And then we experienced another region-wide flood before entering the summer, which is hot. And um, we see a drawdown of the water in most of our streams. And the abundances are typically lower during this time of the year. <clears throat> so the compositional recovery patterns vary. Um, oh, they're fairly similar across uh, these systems. This is an ordination plot of the communities, and each site is represented by a different color. And these numbers represent the months after the hurricane. And I've attempted to create a, a an animation that shows that these different systems experienced similar response patterns. So here we go. In the first month, the green site goes up and then down to the left and then to the right. And then the black site also goes up, down to the left and then slightly to the right. And then lastly, the blue site goes up, down to the left and then to the right. And so the vertical axis appears to be capturing uh, the temporal shifts, everything went up and then came back down again. And the, the horizontal axis uh, appears to be capturing some of the site specific differences. So the sites are, are ordinated on this X axis and appear to be different from one another according to the precipitation gradient. Cause these are our drier sites and these are our, our wetter sites. I apologize for the horrendous colors. All right, here we go. Rainfall quickens the recovery. So now I've separated out some of those spaghetti noodles um, from the previous slide, and we can see the abundance of the fish communities in the arid streams, which have this delayed response, if any. So this one experienced a delayed response, whereas these two experienced experience zero to, to to any response, if if not just a a, a loss of species over time. So. Um, this might indicate that there, these systems require more time to reestablish a food supply. The, the scouring of the hurricane could have removed all of the algae, which was the base of the food web, and it takes time for that algae to regrow and then the food web to, to recolonize after that. It could be because of the infiltration of predators after flooding events. We found uh, largemouth bass, crappie, um, and things which were uncharacteristic of these systems, but we knew that they existed in nearby reservoirs. 
but immediately following a flood, they might infiltrate these streams and conduct a smorgasbord. Uh, and all you eat, can, all you can eat buffet of those guppies that are ordinarily protected by the harsh environmental conditions during low flow periods. Lastly, um, slow resettlement could be an option because these systems might be discontinuous um, due to the their hydrologic profile. So the, so the human response appears to be quicker and more parallel. Most of these systems experienced a hump-shaped relationship where they experienced a boost, which is called the flood pulse, which occurs because a lot of nutrients and things enter these systems and feed a big boom in productivity. And then as with most bubbles, it busts right afterwards. So temporary boost in, in productivity, also a, the flood pulse concept and um, these systems might be more resilient because there's more nearby um, refuge for the different animals, and also uh, the flood dynamic is different in these systems. So this is looking at the response of fish communities to um, the the hurricane across the gradient. And so this is called a log response ratio, which refers to the difference in the abundance immediately after the hurricane relative to its annual average. And we see that the log response ratio of abundance was the greatest in our arid streams. So the, the response to the hurricane is greatest in the drier streams, which is odd because um, the hurricane rains were greatest in areas that received more annual precipitation. And lastly, the diversity, a less significant relationship, but also appears that the response ratio of diversity was also greatest in the drier streams, indicating that these streams are less resilient and, and, uh, and less persistent through dis these dis disturbance events. So Dr. Bradley Strickland is a colleague of mine, and he works with the invertebrate data, and he found that the recovery range exceeded the annual average. So this is the abundance on the bottom here and the diversity on the top for cores and kick samples. And we see that there's this hump rate here that occurs in the abundances. It's very prominent in the core samples, which are more quantitative. And that means um, that there was a, this boost in productivity in the invertebrates as well. And also that the diversity hump follows the abundance hump. So you can, if you can follow your eyes up here, this diversity hump occurs significantly later in the season than the abundance hump occurred. So those are pretty interesting effects. He also looked to see what uh, the relationship between um, the uh, storm and the precipitation rainfall was. And it was interesting because the log response ratio, the, this, this abundance response to the storm was greatest in the drier sites again, and least felt in the humid sites, but that the annual rainfall also corresponds to the storm rainfall. So these wetter sites received more rain, but their abundance was affected less. So these systems appear to be more primed for big storm rainfall events. These are structural equation models, and it shows how the, this is one of my last slides, the annual rain, so the significant relationships are uh, solid arrows, insignificant are with the dotted arrows, but we're trying to connect the dots here. So we see that the annual rain is associated with the flood duration in both the abundance data and the core diversity, which means that these areas that receive more rainfall have vegetation and soil parameters that allow for a longer duration of flood. And we suspect that that's because of the increased amounts of loam and vegetation, which create a spongier system. And so it's slower to release all of that moisture. And um, that's pretty interesting. Um, and I'm gonna wrap this up here. So here's my conceptual model. Um, we look to see we we look to see the big take home points is that rainfall effects occur over a narrow range. 
Most of these are threshold effects that occur between 60 and 80 centimeters of annual rainfall per year in this in this region. It appears that aridity imposes harsh harsh physical conditions and that the rainfall determines resource variety and niche spaces. These represent both bottom up and top down controls and the rainfall regime imparts resistance to uh, the flood events as seen through those log response ratios at the end here. Uh, I'd like to thank my faculty advisors, uh, my colleagues, and my funding sources, which were the Texas A&M University, the NSF, the Texas, uh, the TAMU CC Parents Council, and the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. This is the Coastal and Estuary uh, Ecology Lab, which is where I work now. We work with seagrass ecology, and I do that as a field work while I'm still writing up all the results for my dissertation. And then just some things to, to feed your brains um, through the rest of the day. Um, try and think about connecting concepts across systems. Usually when we look at these systems, everybody's interested in all the individual drivers, but we really need to be trying to connect the, all of these things and maybe look for some master variables like precipitation, which which influences a variety of intermediate drivers that are traditionally used to analyze these systems, but maybe we could get a shortcut by just looking at these systems in terms of the precipitation. These are informative uh, results for strategic management, which may decide that some systems are worth saving and others are not, based off of projections for precipitation in the future. Um, and we're also seeking to connect um, ideas in the flood pulse concept and the river continuum concepts, which are applicable within a system, but not too uh, applicable across different systems. And lastly, connecting these intermediate drivers and maybe finding a shortcut or master variable is like a huge part of what I'm trying to do here. Pleasure to be here and I'll take questions. Thanks so much, Sean. Uh, it strikes me this is almost enough for two dissertations and not just one. <laughs> There's so many different moving parts to this. Um, we've got actually a question. So I, I asked people to post their questions in the chat and then I'll call on them to ask the question. And we've got one right now from Matt Fagan. So Matt, take it away. Hey, Sean, interesting talk. I'm from Texas, so I had a minor point of botany for you. Um, is a mesquite is technically deciduous, uh, but it is too, I mean, you definitely have differences in litter fall. I'm, my question was about differences in land use of your watersheds, right? Cause you've got, you're going from like the suburbs of Houston out, you know, to a pretty agricultural area and then over kind of into potentially the, the watersheds downstream of like San Antonio and Austin, though it's hard to tell cause those things always go so far east before they come south. So I don't I actually don't know what connects and I'm wondering whether you've looked at the land use of your watersheds, you mentioned there's this kind of solidity gradient as you get out into the drier areas that partly may be driven by agriculture. And I'm just wondering, I mean, it's definitely probably drying, obviously, but I'm wondering like how much they differ. Is it pretty minor? Is it a lot? What's your feel? Yeah, we did look at the land use data. Uh, the USGS gauge which gauges um, have profiles for the watersheds. <clears throat> and um, the, the most of the, the so you're right. Those there, we had two sites that were in the suburbs of Houston in the initial initial um, surveys, but the uh, continuation and the monitoring surveys did not have those two sites. Um, and we selected ten sites that are from um, kind of Kingsville area all the way to an area called Ganado or Inez. And throughout that region, it's mostly cattle raising, cotton and um, corn agriculture. There's not a lot of paved surfaces or things like that. Um, our biggest uh, factor was wastewater inputs, um, both the volume and especially volume relative to the stream flow and um, the proximity to our sampling locations. So those were the large um, factors that that were driving um, that are, are are related to human effects, um, but I I would say we did not find that there was a relationship between the land use and any of the patterns that we're seeing in the communities, um, and that's another reason why we chose those ten sites because the land use in the Houston suburbs is different than it is throughout. That that agricultural area that's largely underdeveloped. 
Thanks. Makes sense. Yeah, it's pretty boring if you drive out there. It's just the same country over and over again. But yeah, I'm wondering whether if you had a cattle operation, a CAFO, or something close to one of your streams, you know, it's going to change things. And that's, so that's cool that you, you thought about all that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, open the floor for other questions, please. So while we're waiting to see if one comes in, I'm actually going to just um, uh, ex expand on one small part of what Matt was just asking about. You talked about the wastewater uh, effect being diluted with higher precip, um, and that was obviously in a watershed where you had significant sources coming from um, sanitary sewage. Or if you had not had a uh, significant human population, if it were more, more natural, let's say, with less sanitary sewage, do you think you would have seen anything like that nitrogen anomaly that you were seeing, which was, was tied to the, to the uh, uh, aridity, or was that strictly a function of human population and sewage? You could see a pattern with things like ammonia and biologically generated waste products in an arid system that didn't have very much drainage or available water. And if the if the conditions were anoxic, um, the bacteria in those systems probably wouldn't be able to process it as quickly. So you. So there are studies that have found in arid systems, a buildup of biological ammonia. And so that's a possibility. Um, these are all perennial streams. And one of the reasons why they are perennial is because of the wastewater um, that's provided. There are no natural reservoirs in the state of Texas and also perennial streams like this are rare unless they're generated anthropogenically. Um, so in a natural system, you I would only expect to see a, a nitrogen um, effect once you cross that threshold into those arid systems that have a very reduced flow profile. Interesting. Thanks. Okay, I'll ask again if anybody's got other questions. I have others if nobody does, but I just want to give people a chance. So, as a non ecologist, I'm going to ask you this. Uh, you showed in your flood response fairly rapid recolonization by these fish species that, as you indicated in Hurricane Harvey, just got washed out. Where did they come back from and how did they get there that quickly? Yeah, so that's one of the big questions. Um, and I haven't quite looked at the size class data, which will inform me as to, um, like, did the big fish come in first or what, what, what happened? But um, based off of my understanding of the hydrology during a flood um, that, uh, Larger animals like fish are able to um, either go laterally into the floodplain and, and conduct a, a feeding buffet before returning to the stream again, or they just get washed into a big reservoir, which mediates the massive flows, and then they re-infiltrate from the reservoir. And that's a good question because I should probably look and see which one, which phenomena is more um, applicable to these systems when considering the recolonization profile. With the invertebrates, it's different. They get washed out, the sediment gets totally flushed out, and so it's complete recolonization from um, either nearby um, reservoirs or, or things like that because there's aerial deposition as well as um, aquatic deposition of propagules from, from in, for invertebrates. So they're a little bit different than fish. Yeah, very interesting dynamics. Um, so we're just about out of time. I actually do want to ask one more question about this because you have this precipitation gradient. It's a climatic gradient. I don't remember from the first map. You know, we know that in the in the east we expect things to get wetter overall. We know in the in the arid southwest things are getting drier. It wasn't. I can't remember what you're anticipating from the future climate projections in terms of what will happen to the regions that are specifically within that uh, precipitation gradient close to the. Texas coast. Are you expecting those zones to shift? Is there going to be a monotonic change affecting all of them? Um, I assume this is relevant to your to your to your management um, planning um, uh, component. What you're talking about? It is. That's a great question, Andy. Um, I read a paper that used regional climate models, and uh, it predicts things like uh, wetter winters and drier summers and an intensification of existing gradients in this region specifically. Um, the, the EPA report uh, expects little changes in the overall precipitation throughout the Midwest. 
but huge ch changes along the coastlines. Um, and so the, if anything, we're going to see an intensification within this region of the pattern that we, we currently see. Um, some of those streams um, in that transition zone are at the boundary. And so that's, that's like the zone that we should be interested in, in, in monitoring because we might see over time that those systems flip from, from one type to the other. But um, I mean, vegetation effects lag like oftentimes centuries from the effects of climate and um, the biological effects of, uh, like in fish and invertebrates occur very quickly. And so I wouldn't expect there to be changes in like how much algae is growing in the stream and stuff like that for a long time. But you might see changes in the water quality profile, which would immediately cause top down effects um, through the food webs. And so top down effects would happen much more rapidly than bottom up, which would take a long time for the vegetation to change. Fascinating. So many complex components of the system. I think it's a useful lesson for, uh, for the students who have been participating that uh, uh, see how complicated all these interactions actually can be. So I'm going to thank you. And um, unless somebody wants to pose another question, I think we'll go ahead and stop recording. Um, I'll let people know before we do that. Um, we, as I, as we always do with these seminars, we are going to uh, have the recording posted on the YouTube channel of the Center for Social Science Scholarship, and we will post the link to that and uh, let people know about it once that's available. And please uh, join us for next week's seminar with Dr. Susan Starrett um, from our School of Public Policy. So thanks so much, Sean. Uh, really, really interesting presentation. And I'm going to stop the recording now. Thanks for having me. Y'all have a nice day.